Indira Gandhi National Open University presents an assignment on stenographic skills course code BSSI 014 Let's listen to this assignment Dear learner we welcome you to the program on diploma and modern office practice program code DMOP I Dr Gitika S Jhori is the program coordinator of this particular academic program learners as you are all aware that this program consists of five courses which are communication skills computer skills secretarial practice stenographic skills and office procedures the course on stenographic skills course code BSSI 014 has three components which are term and examination theory term and examination practical and continuous evaluation or assignment learners you are required to secure at least 50% marks in all these three components separately to be declared successful in this course you have already been provided with the print and study material for the stenographic skills course which will help you in gaining theoretical knowledge However in an attempt to upgrade you further we are giving you an audio cd which is a compulsory part of your continuous evaluation or assignment for which you will be evaluated this assignment consists of five different segments comprising of a lecture a convocation address a speech a discussion on legal issue and parliamentary proceedings in lok sabha you are required to listen to each of these segments and transcript any two segments into shorthand text and get it checked by your academic counselor at your respective study center let us now begin with the first segment which is mother teresa memorial lecture by professor a w khan mother teresa was the recipient of of how many honors and awards it's even difficult for anyone to count how many Different recognitions she received, but the one to, in my view, that stands out is the Nobel Peace Prize awarded to her in 1959. In making the award, the nomination has subsequently expressed its recognition of Mother Teresa's work in bringing help to suffering humanity. A feature of her work had been the respect for individual human being for his or her dignity and innate value. The lonely, the destitute, the dying have at our hands received compassion without compensation. Based on reverence, we all know that Mother Teresa's basic philosophy was firmly rooted in her Christian faith. But she was an outstanding practitioner of the universal religion of humanity. She was fully convinced that you cannot be a good Christian, a good Hindu, a good Muslim, a good Sikh, or a good Buddhist. If you are not a good human being, if you do not subscribe to the basic values of love, of compassion, of honesty, of sense of justice and human dignity, you cannot be a good belonging to any religion or any faith or any ethnicity. Mother Teresa was an embodiment of a good human being. Period. I have chosen to speak on power of peace in recognition of Mother Teresa's outstanding contribution to the world of peace. If I were to begin this lecture, I would quote a 17th-century philosopher, Don Quixote, who said, and I quote: "Peace is not an absence of war; it is a virtue, a state of mind, a disposition of benevolence, a confidence, and justice." What the Prince of Philosophers wrote it more than 350 years ago remains valid even today: that the world continues to face many threats to peace. Be there wars between states, civil wars, genocide, or large-scale human rights abuses. By including notions such as freedom from disputes, silence, harmonious relationships, inner contentment, serenity for individuals, communities, and nations, we are broadening the concept of peace by including the dimensions of mutual understanding and consumption. But mutual understanding can only be achieved through a continuous exchange of information and knowledge. Indeed, this free flow of information is the basis of mutual understanding. Today, as the entire planet is interconnected through networks, transferring data and information at a state 
never imagined before. And as access information and knowledge to radio and television newspapers, we definitely have the tools we need in order to understand and listen to the other. It's basically it's I or we versus the other. However, what is it that prevents us from achieving this state of peace in a before? I would argue that to solve conflicts in a peaceful manner, we need to efficiently harness both traditional and new communication information processes and tools in order to advance intercultural dialogue and cross cultural understanding. Learners, I'm sure you must have finished listening to this segment of your assignment. Now let's listen to the convocation address by His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Education, which you got, is like instruments. Now whether that instruments use constructive way, destructive way, up to your own own partner. So education, awareness, much this with our brain. Then these useful instruments in order to utilize in Constructive way must depend on our own partners here. Yeah. So please pay some attention about home partners. So long, home partners there. That means sense of concern of others' well being. That's where extreme self centered blind, blindness or self centered attitude we do. So as a result, you get more inner strength. More inner strength, your conduct carries some credit. Honestly, through that way, you can build trust from the rest of your community. On the basis of trust, we can build friendship. The friendly as a community, the full of friendship, that community will be very happy community. A community, even very rich, but full of suspicion, distrust, you cannot be a happy person from that community. That's something major law. So, more inner strength, honest, good to there. That is the essential of moral ethics. Whether believe or not believe, it's different from second view. Basic thing is moral ethics. I usually stress moral ethics is the basis of happy individual, happy family, happy community, and ultimately happy humanity. Without moral ethics, any individual may not be a happy person. Always too much anxiety, fear, like that. So, moral ethics are not just something. Moral ethics is the practical method, the basis of our happy life, successful life, and a happy community. So sometimes, unfortunately, on this planet, number of people really consider money, material facility, is more important than moral ethics. If that kind of attitude increases, that really is a disaster of humanity. So, everywhere, pay much attention for the education. But equally, you must pay more attention about moral ethics if you want every world, every community, every family. Coming up next for you is now a speech by Julia Gillard. Listen to this particular segment very carefully with proper attention to the accent. I great pleasure to be here and to join friends from India and friends from Australia for this very special launch. Can I say to the Vice-Chancellor, it's been a pleasure to spend some time with you this morning talking about the work that you do at this great university. And it's also great to be joined here by my Australian colleagues from the Queensland University of Technology for this very special launch. And of course, it would be remiss of me to not note that we are meeting at a university named for India's first and only female Prime Minister. I also know that apart from bearing a great name, this is a university that is changing literally millions of lives, not only in India, but around the world. You are the world's largest open university, and that's something to be very proud of, bringing the power of education right through India and to many nations beyond India. The collaboration that we're celebrating today with the Queensland University of Technology is an excellent opportunity for both Australians and Indians to demonstrate what working together can achieve. 
We're working together to meet the education and training needs of students today and students tomorrow. Today's launch reinforces Australia's commitment to support the Indian Government's national education and training objectives. India's Education for All initiative resonates with us in Australia and particularly resonates with me. Australia, like India, values education and values its role in building our communities. In particular, Australia shares India's interests in the fundamental role that basic education plays in helping people to reach their full potential. Without basic education, obviously the world of learning is locked away beyond access. It's so important. In our own country, uh, to demonstrate our belief in the power of education, the government is committed to an education revolution. We are investing billions of dollars in building infrastructure, in furthering early childhood education, improving the quality and equity of primary and secondary school education, investing in information and communications technology, and investing in our vocational education and training and universities. I learned about the exciting and challenging objectives of your new Right to Education Act. Providing free and compulsory education for all children aged 6 to 14 years will be a tremendous challenge for India. But it's essential if every child is to be able to enjoy your country's growing prosperity. This joint project between this university and Queensland's University of Technology is a great example of how we can work together and share some of our experiences in building education systems that are designed to deliver outcomes and change. I've got no doubt that the Queensland University of Technology's commitment to share knowledge with you, to develop practical real-world solutions for the growing teacher training needs of India will make a difference. And of course, the Queensland University of Technology is well placed to participate in this important initiative and this partnership. Its education faculty provides the largest pre-service teacher education program in Australia for both undergraduate and graduate entry students. And of course, the Queensland University of Technology is bringing that special expertise to bear in this new partnership. This is a partnership aimed at driving a new round of teacher training in particular to meet India's needs as its training and education system expands. It's practical, it's cost effective, it's capable of being delivered at scale and consequently it will make a real difference. And that's why I'm very glad to be here personally to show my support for this joint program. I am confident that it will make a real difference and help address the needs of primary schools in provinces across India and consequently help with the education of Indian students today for the world they will encounter tomorrow. Since a stenographer is often encountered with various life scenarios, this particular segment pertains to the legal terms and language. Hope this will help you in acquiring the requisite skills. For an open and democratic society, but the key difference is the fight against poverty and corruption. Freedom will be bereft of all its excellence if the people have no access to information. Access to information is a basic to the democratic way of life. The tendency to withhold information from people at large to them is heavily checked up. And it is for this reason that the government of India has enacted the Right to Information Act 2005 to provide for setting up the practical regime of rights to information for citizens to secure access to information under the control of public authority in order to promote transparency and accountability in the working of any public authority. The law which the national government enacted, it has a three-tier structure. At the bottom is the central public information officer. This is about the central government department and ministries. As far as the state governments are concerned, they have a state public information officer, the bottom level. So at the bottom level you have a 
Public Information Officer in case of central government, we call it Central Public Information Officer and the level of state government, we call it State Public Information Officer. Now, any citizen of the country can seek any information from the Public Information Officer of the central government or the state government as the case may be. If information is given to him, then the matter stands true. But suppose half information is given or no information is given or incomplete information is given, then the citizen of the country has a right to file the first appeal before the first appellate authority. Now, the first appellate authority is a superior officer of the department or ministry or organization concerned, which means that he is higher than the public information officer. Now, you file an appeal and he hears the appeal and decides the matter. Now, if you are satisfied with the decision of the appellate authority, call it first appellate authority, matter stands closed there. But there will be cases, in fact, there are many, many cases where the information seeker is not satisfied either with the decision of the public information officer or with the decision of the first appellate authority. In that case, he files second appeal before the Central Information Commission or State Information Commission as the case may be. Now, the commissions are the final appellate authority. Now, this is the mechanism. I repeat, you seek information from the public information officer, file first appeal, if need be, before the first appellate authority, file second appeal before the commission, Central Information Commission or the State Information Commission as the case may be. Now, I also take this opportunity of just telling that the Central Public Information Officer or State Public Information Officer is mandated to give you information in 30 days' time. Similarly, the first appellate authority is mandated to decide the appeal in 30 days' time. 30 days, 30 days. Sometimes 5 days extra time is given. But when the second appeal is filed in the Information Commission, Central State, there is no upper time limit provided for that. I also want to tell that this is very important. There are two issues in which information has to be disclosed just in 48 hours. One, matters relating to habeas corpus. Somebody has been kicked out and they have been kept by the law enforcement agency or anybody in an unknown place or something. And if somebody seeks information about such individuals, then that information is required to be disclosed in 48 hours. Similarly, information relating to matters of corruption, human rights violations and corruption. This stands on a special register. It has to be disclosed in 48 hours. This is the scheme of law. Lastly, go through these parliament proceedings in Lok Sabha and write down your responses. Question number 84, Shri Madhu Kaur Yaski. Question number 84. Yes, Honorable Minister. Madam Speaker, an answer has been laid on the table of the House. Yes, your first supplementary. Madam Speaker, it is shocking to, disturbing to see the number of attacks on Indian Embassy and Indians in elsewhere, including Australia and other countries. Madam Speaker, before the July 7th, 2008 attack, I was myself in, the, in, in Afghanistan, Kabul, uh, the ABA member of parliament delegation. The personnel working at embassies work on extreme hardships. The families are not allowed to be there. In this July 7th incident where we lost an outstanding IFS officer, three other officers who completed his term, he was the last one to see us off and said, like, I'll be coming to India in next month, August, to see him join my family. It is the within for 15 months or so, the another attack in Indian embassy in Kabul. Madam Speaker, I would like to ask the Honorable Minister. I've seen the answer placed before on the table. The steps which is the government is taking, not just taking up to the Afghan government. In Afghanistan, it is the US and other coalition forces which is monitoring the law and order situation there. It is known fact, it is ISI, Al-Qaeda, these are the terror groups operating in Afghanistan to Pakistan to Bangladesh. Is there any measure taken by the government to take up this issue with the those security forces of these coalition forces operating in Afghanistan? And also the Honorable Minister is a former UN official, whether it's taken in steps to isolate these terror groups and sensitize those other countries who are presence in the countries and take not only India but take their help also to contain these terror groups. Yes. Madam Speaker, we share the great concern expressed by the Honourable Member about the security of Indian personnel both in the embassy and on various projects in which we are assisting the people of Afghanistan. 
Security is fundamentally, of course, the responsibility of the host government, and the Afghan government has given us assurances of additional measures they have taken. Indeed, we all have noticed that the tragic assault on our embassy on the 7th of July 2008 did result in certain security measures, with the result that the assault in October of this year did not, in fact, create any Indian fatalities. So there have been some improvements. We continue to work with the Afghan authorities, and of course we are in touch with those who are providing security in Afghanistan. I might add that we completed successfully the construction of a 218-kilometer road in Afghanistan, in southwestern Afghanistan, where the protection was provided by our own personnel, our own paramilitary personnel, and they were able to ward off certain attacks on that project, and they've now been de-inducted and come back. So where necessary, we will provide our own security to our ongoing projects. Yes, your second supplementary. Madam Speaker, to engage in Afghanistan, we are undertaking a lot of development activities to see that by and large the people in Afghanistan against those coalition forces were present there. But by and large they are quite uh, sympathetic or welcoming the Indian or Indian presence there. So since the Indians, not only the Indian officials at the embassies, but a lot of uh, civilians working in Afghanistan when various <coughs> power projects to roads and other projects, what are the steps taken by the government to safeguard those other civilians working in Afghanistan? Madam Speaker, first of all I'd like to endorse the point made by the Honorable Member about the effectiveness of our economic development programs. We have been active in doing everything from building roads to hospitals, clinics, schools, and the kind of development assistance we've given has been welcomed. There is a recent Gallup poll in Afghanistan which shows that India's role has been the highest praised by the Afghan public, with 56% of Afghans praising India's role in reconstruction. Indeed, I might add that uh, the United Nations only got 51% and NATO 44%. Similarly, the economic development of the country, India, got the highest rating in this public opinion poll. So we are very happy that our efforts are being appreciated and acknowledged by the Afghan people. Indeed, everything from electricity transmission. Right now, if Kabul has 24 hours a day of electricity, it is because of Indian engineers. Now, we are conscious that we must not send our citizens into danger, and so all sorts of security measures are being taken to ensure that they remain safe while working. Nonetheless, sadly, in the course of all these activities, and including the attacks on our embassy, we have lost 13 lives in the course of the last few years in Afghanistan. Each Indian life is precious to us. We will take as many measures as are realistic and feasible to ensure that we do not have to fear this. But the development commitment, Madam Speaker, is extremely important for us to maintain in Afghanistan. Learners, hope this assignment activity must have been an enriching experience for you. Listen to these as often as possible to improve your skills. Thank you. You were listening to the assignment on Stenographic Skills, course code PSSI 014. Studio recording, Zainuddin and Parvesh Kumari. Editing, Sadan Lal. Content Coordinator, Dr. Geetika Johri. Producer, Manoj Bhatnagar. We are thankful to Lok Sabha TV and Lok Sabha Secretariat for granting permission to to use the audio clips of Lok Sabha proceedings as part of this audio assignment for DMOP students. This program was brought to you by Electronic Media Production Center of Indira Gandhi National Open University.